What is up guys, welcome to Barton, my name is Heinrich, and today we're going to take a look at creating the second enemy in our enemy series. So let's just get right into it. So let's start off by taking a look at another finite state machine diagram that I made for our second enemy. As you can see, we're going to be reusing a lot of our states. We have our move state, idle state, player detected state, melee attack state, look for player state, and then our dead and stun state. And as you can see, we only have two new states that we need to make, our dodge state and our range attack state. So let's go into Unity and let's start off by importing our new sprites. So let's go to our sprites folder, go to our enemies folder, and then let's just drag that in. And then we can set our pixels per unit to 16. Sprite mode is multiple, filter mode is point no filter, and then we can change the compression to none, hit apply, go to the sprite editor, hit slice, grid by cell size, and 64 by 64 is right. We can then hit apply, and now we have all of our sprites. Perfect. Okay, and now let's create a new empty game object for our second enemy. Call it enemy2. And then create a child game object that we'll call alive, just like our first enemy. And before we start with any of the scripts, let's just go ahead and make all the animations for our second enemy. So let's start off by clicking on the alive game object and adding our animator component. And then we need to go to our animator controller folder and create a new animator controller. And this one we'll just call enemy to AC. We probably should rename our first one to enemy one AC like that. Now let's click on our alive game object and drag in our controller. And now we can pull up our animation window and we can start creating our animations. So let's click create and then navigate to our animations folder, enemies. And let's actually just make a new folder for our enemy one. And then let's just drag all of our old animations in there. We can't select all of them, so we'll do that later. Let's create a new folder called enemy2, open that up, and let's start with our move animation. So we'll say enemy2 underscore move, go ahead and save that, and then let's go back to our sprites folder, and then come to our enemy2 sprites, and the first eight sprites is our walk animation. So actually zero to seven, go ahead and drag that in. We can change our sample rate to 15. And now let's just make sure we know where this enemy is. So let's just reset the transform. And let's move that up here. Whoops. Like that. Let's just play this animation. We probably can't see it. Okay, so as you can see, our animator added our sprite render component for us. We just need to make sure we come in and set the sorting layer to enemy. There we go, now we can see him and we can watch our walk animation. It's a little bit fast, let's maybe change this down to 10. Yeah, I like that a little bit more. Okay, cool. Now let's make our next animation, which is our idle animation. So enemy two, underscore idle. And these frames should be frames eight to 12, 11, yeah. Drag those in. Change the sample rate to five as this should be a little bit slower. That looks good to me. And now let's create our next animation, which is our shoot animation. So enemy two underscore ranged attack. And that should be frame 12. I'm not quite sure. Let's see how many frames we have. So we have one, so frame 12 to frame 22. So we have frames 12 to 22, drag that in, change the sample rate to 15. Let's see what that looks like. Cool. So as you can see, the animation is quite fast. So I'm going to space out the frames a little bit. So we have the draw animation like that. And here the bow is fully extended. So let's maybe have him hold this position for about three frames before he shoots. That looks a lot better. Maybe one more, four frames. Cool. And then here we shoot. 
might have him hold this frame one frame longer like this so now our animation looks like that I like it perfect okay okay next we have our melee attack animation for the archer so let's create a new clip call it enemy 2 underscore melee attack and this time it's frame and this time it's sprites 23 to 32. Drag that in, change the sample rate to 15 again. Let's see what that looks like. As you can see, it's again really quick. So maybe we'll have him hold this position for an extra frame. And then we'll have it hold this, this frame one longer. So move this out one. Let's see what that looks like. Looks good to me, okay. So now we have our move, idle, range attack, melee attack animations. Now all that we have left is our dodge animation and our stunned animation. So let's just start off with our stunned animation because that's gonna be a little bit easier. So enemy two underscore stunned, like that. And that should be the last four frames. Drag those in, change the sample rate to five. Looks good to me. Okay, so now for our dodge animation, let me just open up the sprite editor so we can see, we have these three frames. Now we have our anticipation frame, which is just the character crouching down before he jumps. And then we have a frame for moving up and a frame for moving down. So we're gonna use the same thing we did with our player. If we take a look at the player's animator, where we have the jump uh, full blend tree, where we have the three different frames, depending on what stage of the jump we are. So let's just click on our alive game object again, go back to our scene, and let's create the anticipation frame. So enemy to, and we'll actually just call it dodge start, save that. And I think that should be frame 33, yep. So just drag that in there. We'll change the sample rate to 15. And now instead of only having one frame in here, we're actually gonna copy this and paste it here. This way we can change how long we want the anticipation animation to last. Just gonna put it like that. And now let's create the dodge up animation and the dodge down animation. So enemy to underscore dodge up. And that should be frame 34. Yep, drag that one in. This one just leave as is because it's only one frame. And then next we have dodge down. So create new clip, enemy two underscore dodge down and 35. Yep, so frame 35 is our dodge down animation. Perfect, so now we have all the animations we're gonna need for our enemy two. So we can just go ahead and close the animation window. And now let's start taking a look at the states. So first and foremost, let's come to our scripts folder, go to our enemies folder, enemy specific folder, and let's create our enemy two folder. And now in our enemy two folder, let's create a new C sharp script that we're gonna call enemy two. So this is our enemy two specific entity class, basically. Let's go ahead and open that up. and then we can come back to Unity. Let's take a look at our state diagram again. So let's go the same route we went with enemy one and just start with our move and idle states. So back in Unity, in our enemy specific enemy two folder, let's create another C-sharp script. And this time we'll call it E2 underscore move state and create another script called E2 underscore idle state. Okay, so let's start off with our move state. So let's go ahead and open that up. And then we can get rid of this pre-generated code, make it inherit from our move state. And then we can generate our constructor. And now we need to get a reference to our enemy two instead of enemy one this time. So we have a private enemy two called enemy. 
And then in our constructor, we just add enemy to enemy. And then we say this dot enemy equals enemy. And then next we can generate our function override. So click on the name, control full stop, generate overrides, and we don't want the first three. Same old, same old. We can go ahead and save that. And now before we do anything else in here, let's take a look at our idle state. So e2 idle state, go ahead and delete this code, make it inherit from idle state. And then let's add our constructor, get the reference to our enemy. So private enemy to enemy, add it to the constructor. Inside the constructor, we want to say this dot enemy equals enemy. And then let's add the overrides. Just like that. Go ahead and save that. Okay, now let's take a look at our enemy two class. Again, we can go ahead and get rid of this code, make it inherit from entity. Same as we did with our enemy one. And you can always go and look at our enemy one class and see what we did in case we need to remember. So as you can see, first we have, we declare all of our states, then we have the data for all of our states, and then we just initialize those states in our start function. So let's come back to enemy two. Okay, so let's start with our move state. So we're going to have a public e2 underscore move state called move state. And don't forget the public getter and the private setter. Next, we have our idle state. So public e2 underscore idle state called idle state. Public get private set. And then next we have our data. And in this case, we're going to have a serialized field private. And because we start off all of our data state names with a D underscore, we can get a nice list of all the scripts we have available. So we're looking for our D underscore move state that we'll call move state data. And then next we have our private D underscore idle state called idle state data. Now let's go ahead and create the start function. And then in the start function, we can create our state objects. So move state equals a new e2 underscore move state. And for our entity, we're passing this for our state machine, we're passing state machine. And as you can see, we didn't have to declare state machine again, because it's part of entity, which we inherit from. Then we need our animation boolean name, which in this case is going to be move. Then we have our state data, which is move state data. And enemy two is this. Now there might be a way to make this process even more efficient using things like generics, but I'm not quite at that level yet. I'll figure that out eventually. And then when I do, I'll be happy to share it with you guys once again. So next we have our idle state, which is going to be a new e2 underscore idle state. This for the entity state machine for the state machine idle for the animation name idle state data for our data. I see I made a mistake there. Let's add an a at the end. And then this for our enemy two. Now, if we take a look at our enemy one class again, you can see that we need to initialize our first state. And I also noticed I made a mistake with the start function, because as you can see over here, we have public override void start, whereas in enemy two, we have private void start. So seeing as we're inheriting from entity, and we have a public virtual void start function in entity, we need to override it here. So we'll change this to public override void start. And then inside the start function, we just need to add base dot start. Again, this base dot start is not required. You just need it here if you want to call the code from the base class that we're inheriting from. So let's not forget to initialize the first state. So we'll say state machine dot initialize and we'll pass our move state as our first state. Let's just go ahead and click on enemy two and generate the rest of our overrides. We can look at this, we might not want all these functions. We don't really need to override our checks at all. 
We might want to later on, but for now we're good. We don't want to override our damage hop, our stun resistance, our flip. We can add our on draw gizmos. We don't need these. We don't need these. And I don't even think we need our update or fixed update. So really we only want to override our damage and our on draw gizmos function. Let me just go ahead and check in enemy one if that is the case. Yep, see we do not have our update functions here either. Cool. So now let's go ahead and set up the enemy so that this will actually work. So let's go back to Unity. And to start off with, let's click on our enemy to a live game object. And let's just throw in a default sprite so that we can see it when the game is not running. So we can come to sprites, enemies, and we'll just use the first sprite. Cool, now we can see him. I'm actually gonna use Sprite 9, so it's our idle animation. That looks a bit better. So now we can go ahead and drag our enemy2 script onto our enemy2 game object, like that. And then we can start seeing everything that we need. So we need to have our entity data, our wall check position, ledge check position, player check position, ground check position, our move state data, and our idle state data. So let's start with all the transforms. So let's click on our alive game object and create an empty game object. And we have four transforms to add, I think. Yep. So let's just go ahead and duplicate this three more times. So the first one is going to be our ledge check position. So we'll just call it ledge check. The second one is our wall check position. Third is our player check. Whoops. And then fourth is our ground check. So let's just go ahead and click on enemy two and drag all of these in. So ledge check goes to ledge check, wall check goes to wall check, player check goes to player check, and ground check goes to ground check. Now before we can start seeing any gizmos for these checks, we need to add our entity data. So in our enemy specific enemy2 folder, let's create our data folder. So create a new folder, call it data. And then in our data folder, let's just go ahead and create a new entity data base data. And we'll just call it e2 underscore base data. And as you can see, all of our defaults are set there. We just need to remember to set ground to ground and what is player to player, and then maybe a default hit particle. So let's just lock the inspector and go to our prefabs folder and we'll just use enemy one hit particle again. So go ahead and drag that in. And then now we can unlock our inspector and click on our enemy two game object and drag in our base data to our entity data slot. And as you can see, now we can see our different check distances and that's good. So let's reposition our ledge check and wall check and all those things. So the ledge check can go around here and then wall check can just be just around there. Player check should be around there. And then ground check should be at the bottom. Maybe a little bit up like that. Perfect. Okay, let's see what else we need. So next we need to have our move state data. So let's create a new state data. This is going to be our move state. We'll call it E2 underscore move state data. You can go ahead and drag that in. And then now let's do our idle state. So data, state data, idle state. And let's just call it e2 underscore idle state data. And then let's drag that one in. And now the only thing we have left to set up is our animator. So let's click on our alive game object and go to our animator. And as you can see, all the animations we created have been set up for us, but we'll just get to them as we get to them. We'll keep move as our entry point, seeing as our move state is our first state that we initialized to. Let's come to our parameters and let's create our move parameter, which is a Boolean. So move, and then also create our idle parameter. And let's set up the transitions. So from the start, we'll just set up so from the start, we'll just set it up the way we did for enemy one. So we'll create a new empty state that we'll just call empty. And then we can make our first transition from move to empty. 
click on the transition, make sure has exit time is not ticked, go into the settings, change the transition duration to zero, and add a condition. This condition is move must be false because we're going out of the move state. Now let's add the transition back to the move state. Again, has exit time is not ticked, transition duration is zero, and the condition in this case is move must be true. Now let's add our idle state to the mix. So I'll just drag this one down here, make a transition up to empty, untick has exit time, transition duration is zero, add the condition that idle must be false. Now the transition from empty back to idle, untick has exit time, transition duration is zero, add the condition that idle must be true. Perfect. So everything should be in place now. Let's give it a little test. Let's go ahead and run the game. Okay, so I actually forgot a lot of things. Our alive game object still needs a rigid body 2D and a collider. So let's go ahead and add a rigid body 2D. Under the rigid body 2D, we want to make sure we remember to set the gravity scale to 8, change the collision detection to continuous, and then under constraints, we want to tick freeze rotation. Next, we want our collider. So let's go ahead and add a 2D box collider. And then we can just edit it down to fit our sprite. So like that. Perfect. Okay, let's give it a try. Another thing we forgot to add, we should probably make a list of things that we need to add so we don't forget. But another thing we need to add is our physics material. Because currently we set the velocity and then the enemy just stopped because he has friction. So let's go to our materials folder and let's grab our player material and drag that in there. Now it should work, fingers crossed. So close. So as you can see, our enemy started in the move state, but he walked off the ledge because we have not set up any of the state transitions yet. So now we can go back to our code and now we'll work in our E2 idle and E2 move state. So if we take a look at our state diagram that we have here, this is going to be the same as it was for enemy one. So if a ledge or a wall is reached from our move state, we're gonna go to our idle state. And then once the idle time is over, we're gonna go back to our move state. So let's go to our script and then in our move state, seeing as this is where we start, all we need to do is come down to our logic update function and we'll say if is detecting wall or not is detecting ledge, then state machine dot change state to enemy dot idle state like that. And we also need to remember to set our turn after idle to be true or flip after idle. So we'll say enemy dot idle state dot set flip after idle. And we want to set this to true. Now, if we just really look at our state diagram again, you can see we also have a transition to our player detected state. So let's just leave ourselves a little note, a little to do saying transition to player detected state. This way we won't forget. Let's take a look at our idle state. And in our logic update function, all we need to do is say if is idle time over, then state machine dot change state to enemy dot move state. And now it's set up. Now we also want to be able to detect the player from our idle state. So let's just add ourselves another little to do. And let's just shorten this to PDS for player detected state. We'll know what it means, hopefully. So let's jump back into Unity and see if this worked. As you can see, our enemy detects the ledge, goes back to the other side, detects the ledge. Perfect. Now, of course, these are also just the default parameters that we can mess around and change. But as you can see, this was a very small amount of code that we had to write to get this behavior back in. So now let's move on to the player detected state. So let's come back to our enemy two folder and let's create a new C sharp script that we'll call E2 underscore player detected state like that. 
go ahead and open it up in Visual Studio. We can get rid of this code, make it inherit from player detected state. Boom, generate the constructor, add the reference to our enemy two. So we have a private enemy two called enemy and then add that to our constructor. So enemy two enemy in the constructor, we say this dot enemy equals enemy. Go ahead and generate the overrides. We don't want the first three. And again, we probably don't want a lot of these. Usually most of our code is going to happen in our logic update, but I just like having them there. It looks pretty. It's all just personal preference. And there we go. There are enemy two player detected state is set up. So let's take a look at our state diagram again. And as you can see, we currently don't have any transitions back to our move or idle state from our player detected state. So we'll have to move on to these other states, but we can at least add these transitions in so long. So back in our idle state, let's start with this one. We can get rid of our to do because that's what we're doing. And we'll just say if is player in min aggro range, then we want to go to our player detected state. So state machine dot change state to enemy dot player detected state. Now we're not going to get an autocomplete because we did not add this to enemy two yet, but we'll just go ahead and finish the line like that. And now let's go to enemy two and let's create the variable. So we're going to have a public E2 underscore player detected state called player detected state. Create the public getter and the private setter. And then we need the data for the state. So serialize field, whoops, serialize field private D underscore player detected state called player detected state data. And then we might as well come and call the constructor. So player detected state equals a new E2 underscore player detected state with this as our entity state machine as our state machine. The animation Boolean name is going to be player detected. And then our state data is player detected state data and this as our enemy two. So the error should have gone away in our idle state, which it did. And now we just need to remember to change the second if to an else if, because we don't want this overriding this state change. Now let's go to our move state and we can do the same thing. So get rid of the to do, then we can say if is player in min aggro range, then state machine dot change state to enemy dot player detected state. And then just change this to an else if. Perfect, so now we have our transitions to our player detected state. Let's see which state we wanna do next. So the next state we should do is our melee attack state because we still need to create the dodge and range attack states. So this will be the quickest one to do now. So let's head back to Unity. And before we forget, let's create the data for our player detected state. So create data, state data, player detected state, and we'll call it E2 underscore player detected state data. Click on our enemy two game object, and then we can just drag that in. Now back in the enemy two folder, let's create a new C sharp script. We'll call this E2 underscore melee attack state. Then we can go ahead and open that up. And let's get rid of this code, make it inherit from melee attack state. We can go ahead and create the constructor and let's get the reference to our enemy two. So private enemy two called enemy. And let's add that to the constructor, which is getting quite long. Enemy two enemy this dot enemy equals enemy. And now let's go ahead and generate the overrides. So we don't want the first three, just like that. So from our melee attack state, we either want to go to our look for player state if we cannot detect the player, 
or to our player detected state if we do detect the player. So we don't have this state set up yet. So let's just create this transition so long. So in our logic update function, we can come and say if, and in our melee attack state, we know that we can transition out of the state once the animation is over. And we have that set up in our base melee attack state. So we can just say if is animation finished, then we either want to transition to our player detected state or our look for player state. So we'll say if is player in min aggro range, then state machine dot change state to enemy dot player detected state. And now let's just leave ourselves a little to do to come back and add the look for player state. So look for player state. Cool, so now we can go ahead and go to our enemy2 class and set up our melee attack. So we'll come and we'll say public e2 underscore melee attack state. Call it melee attack state. Add the public getter and the private setter. Next, we need the state data. So serialize field, private e underscore melee attack called melee attack state data. Then we can go ahead and call the constructor melee attack state equals a new e2 underscore melee attack state. This as the entity. Then we have our state machine as our state machine. Our animation boolean name is melee attack. And then next we have our attack position, which is a transform that we still need to declare. So let's go ahead and do that as well. So we'll have another serialized field, private transform called melee attack position. Let's just pass that to the constructor. And then next we have our melee attack data. And then finally we pass this as our enemy. So currently we already have our transition going out of our melee attack state. Now we just need our transition going into our melee attack state. So let's go to our player detected state, which if we look at our state diagram, we can go to our melee attack state from our player detected state. And then in our logic update function, we'll just say if perform close range action, then state machine dot change state to enemy dot melee attack state like that. Now we just need to go to unity and set up everything for the attack. So first of all, we know we need our new attack transform. So let's just go ahead and create that as a child game object of alive and we'll call it melee attack position. And then click on enemy two, go ahead and drag that in. And then we also need our melee attack state data. So let's go to our data folder, create data, state data, melee attack state. We'll call it e2 underscore melee attack. And then we can go ahead and click on our enemy two again and drag that in. I'm seeing I'm being very inconsistent with the naming again. So let's just go ahead and fix that. So it's melee attack state data, spelling mistake here. Cool. So now we just need to set up the animation. So let's go back to our animator. Here we have our melee attack. We can just go ahead and make a transition from it to our empty animation state. Untick has exit time, transition duration is zero. And then we need to add our condition or our Boolean parameter, which is melee attack. We can go ahead and change the condition to melee attack is false. Then let's add the transition back from empty to melee attack. Untick has exit time. Set the transition duration to zero. And the condition this time is melee attack is true. The other one is false. Perfect. Now we also need to remember to add that other script that we made that allows our alive game object animations to communicate with our states. So this animation to state machine script, let's go ahead and add that to our alive game object. 
Just throw that on here like that. Perfect. Now we need to go back to our melee attack animation and we need to create those animation events. So at the punch point, we want to add an animation event and we want to call trigger attack. And then at the end of our animation, we want to add another event and call finish attack like that. Just go ahead and run and see what happens. See if we forgot anything. So go ahead and jump over here. He detects us. And then if we get super close, he tries to punch us. Perfect. Player detected does not exist. Did we forget? So we have not yet added our player detected animation. So let's go back to our animator. Now I don't have a specific animation for player detected. So we'll just use the idle animation as well. So let's create another state and then we'll name it uh, enemy2 underscore player detected, like that. Let's add the parameter, which is a Boolean called player detected. And then let's add the transitions. So we'll make a transition to our empty, make sure has exit time is not ticked, change the transition duration to zero, add the condition which is player detected is false. And then let's make the transition going back. Untick has exit time, transition duration is zero, and player detected is true. Perfect. Oh. <laughs> okay, so we need to also remember to come to our alive game object and set its tag to enemy, even though we're not using the tag anywhere yet, you know, might as well. And then set the layer to damageable. And we want to say no, only this object because it doesn't matter what layer our checks are on. So as you can see now he tries to punch us. But he's not doing any damage yet. I wonder why. Ah, okay. So now we also need to remember to come back to our data. And for our melee attack state data, what is player needs to be set to player. He should be able to damage us now. Yep. As you can see, he can damage us. As you can see, he's going to be stuck in the attack animation because we have not yet set up the transition if we do not detect the player. But so everything is working. The only thing is we cannot see our attack radius. So let's go ahead and add that. We need to add that in our enemy2 uh, on draw gizmos function. So we'll say gizmos dot draw wire sphere and we're drawing that on our melee attack position dot position and the radius is going to be our melee attack state data dot attack radius so we should be able to see it now there we go so let's just go ahead and position that a little bit better we can go ahead and take a look at our melee attack animation So our punch is around there. So let's just move it like this. I think that looks good. Perfect, so now we have a melee attack. Go ahead and see what that looks like again. Boom. Perfect, okay, let's see what's next. So I think next we should create the look for player state. And we'll just go ahead and create all the other states that we already have before we look at our ranged attack and dodge states. So let's go ahead and go back to our enemy2 folder. And let's create a new C-sharp script that we'll call e2 underscore look for player state. And then let's just go ahead and open that up so long. We can go ahead and delete this code and make it inherit from our look for player state. Now let's go ahead and generate our constructor. And then let's get a reference to our enemy2. So private enemy2 called enemy. And then add that to the constructor. So enemy2 enemy this dot enemy equals enemy. And then we just need our function overrides. We don't want the first three, click OK. 
Perfect. Now I know I keep pulling this up, but it helps us see what we need to do. So currently we only have one state that goes to our look for player state because we haven't made these yet. But then, actually no, I lie, we have two because we also have our damage function, but we'll deal with that one later. For now, we'll just implement this transition. And then from our look for player state, we have two transitions either to our move state or our player detected state. So we can implement all three of those states right now. Now it actually looks like I forgot another transition in this diagram from our player detected state to our look for player state. So if our enemy no longer detects our player, we want to look for the player before we go back to moving. Okay, so let's go ahead and implement that. So to start off with, let's head to our enemy2 class and add our look for player state. So we first need to have a public e2 underscore look for player state called look for player state, create the public getter and the private setter. And then next we need the data for the state. So serialized field, private d underscore look for player state called look for player state data. And then let's go ahead and call the constructor. So look for player state equals a new e2 underscore look for player state. And we'll pass this as the entity, state machine as the state machine. Our animation Boolean name is look for player. Next, our data is look for player state data. And then finally, our enemy two is this. Cool, so now look for player state should be in the autocomplete when we try to transition to it. So let's start off by going to our player detected state and we'll just come and say else if is player in max aggro range is no longer true. So we have a exclamation mark in the front. Then we wanna to transition to our look for player state. So state machine dot change state to enemy dot look for player state like that. Now let's do it in the melee attack state as well. So if the animation is finished, else if not is player in min aggro range, then we want to say state machine dot change state to enemy dot look for player state. And then we can just go ahead and get rid of this to do like that. Okay, now in our look for player state, we want to come to our logic update function. And we simply want to say if is player in min aggro range, meaning we have detected the player, then state machine dot change state to enemy dot player detected state. Else if is all turns time done, then state machine dot change state to enemy dot move state like that. So let's go back to unity. And now we just need to remember to add our state data. So we'll come to our data folder, create a new data state data. And we're looking for our look for player state, call it e2 underscore look for player state data. And then we can just go ahead and add that to our enemy two. And now let's set up the animation. So let's head to the animator. Again, we're just going to use our idle state animation for our look for player state animation. So let's create a new empty state, call it enemy two underscore look for player. And then let's go ahead and add the parameter. So it's a new Boolean called look for player. And I'm just gonna drag it to the top because it's gonna make the transitions a little bit faster. So we can make a transition from look for player to empty, click on it, make sure it has exit time is not ticked. Under settings, change the transition duration to zero, add the condition, and the condition is look for player must be false. Next, we add a transition from empty back to look for player, set has exit time to false, transition duration is zero, add the condition look for player is true. Perfect. So I think that's everything we need. So let's go ahead and run the game. And we'll just wait for him to move. So now if he spots us, he should stop moving. And then if we leave the max aggro distance, 
he looks for us and then he starts moving again. Everything is working perfectly. So next we have our stun state. So let's go ahead and go back to enemy two and let's create a new C sharp script, call it P2 underscore stun state. And then we can go ahead and open that up so long, get rid of this code and then make it inherit from stun state. Then we can generate the constructor, get the reference to enemy two, so private enemy two, call it enemy, add it to the constructor. So enemy two enemy and this dot enemy equals enemy. And now let's go ahead and create the overrides. We don't want the first three. Perfect. So now in our stun state, what do we do? We want to wait for the stun time to be over. And then once it is over, if you look at our transition diagram, it looks like I did not add them. So let's just ignore that. But basically once the stun time is over, we either want to go back to our player detected state if we detect our player or we want to look for our player. So in our logic update function, we'll say if is stun time over, then we want to say if is player in min aggro range, then state machine, oh, then state machine dot change state to enemy dot player detected state. Else, so our player is no longer detected, state machine dot change state to enemy dot look for player state, just like that. Now we just need to take care of transitioning to our stun state. And we do that from our enemy to class. So in our damage function, we want to say if is stunned, because remember, this is a Boolean that gets set to true once our stun resistance goes below zero, and our current state, so state machine dot current state, does not equal our stun state. Although we have not yet declared our stun state in our enemy two, so let's go ahead and do that quickly. So we have a public e2 underscore stun state, and we'll just call it stun state. Have our public getter and our private setter. Then we need the state data, so serialize field private d underscore stun state, call it stun state data. Then we can come and call the constructor. So stun state equals a new e2 stun state. We'll pass this as the entity state machine as our state machine. The animation Boolean name is stun. And then for state data, we have stun state data. And then finally, we pass this as our enemy two. So now we should be able to reference it in our damage function. Cool. So if we are stunned, and our current state is not stunned, then state machine dot change state to stun state. Okay, so let's go ahead and save that. And then let's try it out. We just need to make sure we add the state data. So we'll come to our data folder create a new data, state data, stun state data, call it e2 underscore stun state data. And then we can go ahead and drag that in. So we'll click on enemy two, drag this in. Then we can click on our stun state data object again, and our set our knockback angle to one one for x and y. And now we just need to set up the animation. So we'll come to our animator. We have our stun animation already set up. So let's just position that better. And then we need to add our Boolean parameter, which is just called stun. Let's drag that back up to the top. And then our first transition is from empty to stun state. Then we can click on the transition, untick has exit time, set the transition duration to zero, and add the condition that stun is true. Then we have transition from stun back to empty set exit time to false, transition duration is zero, and our condition this time that stun is false. So let's go ahead and try that out. So we can hop over and we can damage him. Oh, the knockback is quite big. As you see, he comes out of the stun 
All good. Perfect. Oh, and I just got double teamed. Okay. Oh, well. So our stun velocity might be a little bit high. So let's go to E2 stun state data and the stun knockback speed. Let's do like eight. And I also noticed when we damaged him, he wasn't hopping. And I think that's because our default uh, damage hop speed is set to low. So let's just go ahead and change that to 10. And I think now if we damage the enemy, he should hop. Yep, as you can see, he hops and he gets stunned and he recovers and he'll punch us. Perfect. So now finally, before we move on to our ranged attack and dodge states, we just need to add the dead state. So let's go back to our enemy two folder, create a new C-sharp script, call it E2 underscore dead state. You can go ahead and open that up and then get rid of this code, make it inherit from dead state, and then we can generate the constructor, add our reference to enemy two, and then add it to the constructor. So enemy two, enemy, this dot enemy equals enemy. And then let's get the function overrides. So this was all a bit pointless because we don't actually do anything in here yet, but it's good to have it for when we want it. So now we just need to come to enemy two and then create the dead state. So public e2 underscore dead state, call it dead state. And then we'll just have a public getter and a private setter. Then next we need the data. So serialize field private d underscore dead state, call it dead state data. And then we can call the constructor. So dead state equals a new e2 underscore dead state. This as our entity, state machine as our state machine, dead as our animation boolean name, dead state data which I misspelled again. So just control R twice on that. And then we can get rid of the L. Perfect. And then this as our enemy. So if you wanted to play a specific dying animation first, you could do it in the dead state. I also forgot to put a semicolon after dead state data. So I'll just add that in there. And now if we go back to unity, go to our data folder and then create a new data state data dead state data, you can see we have the two slots for our particles. So let's just call this E2 underscore dead state data. And let's lock the inspector and then go to our prefabs folder, add our death blood particle and our death chunk particles. Like that. And seeing as we disabled the game logic for now, we don't have to bother with setting up anything in the animator. But if you want to go ahead, and now before we can actually kill him, we need to set up those transitions in our damage function. So in our damage function, we can say if is dead, which is our Boolean that gets set to true once our health goes below zero, then state machine dot change state to our dead state like that. And then don't forget to change this to else if. Now I want to make it so that when I hit the enemy, from behind, he will immediately turn to face me. So we can just say else if, and the condition for this if is that our player is not in front of us. So we can say not check player in min aggro range. Then, so in here, we'll just transition to our look for player state, but seeing as the enemy got hit from behind, you know, he will intuitively know to immediately look behind him. So here we can say look for player state dot set turn immediately to true. So remember, this is the function that we added in our look for player state. So if this is true, we will immediately turn once we enter that state. So then we can just say state machine dot change state to look for player state like that. And we forgot to add our brackets for the function. Perfect. So if we run the game now, we should be able to kill him. But let's also hit him from behind and see if that worked. So as you can see, he turned immediately and he detected us. 
and we can still not kill him. Why? Okay, we have an error. Let's see what that is. Oh, okay, so I forgot to add the data to the enemy. So click on enemy two, unlock this, go to our project, go to our enemy two data folder and drag the dead state data into the slot. Now we should be able to kill him. Let's give it a try. Boom, and he's dead. Perfect. Cool, so I think this is a great place to end this episode. We've added all of the states that we already created to this enemy. And then next we just need to create the dodge state and the range attack state. And then we're done with this enemy. So I hope you guys saw how much faster it was to create this second enemy. And before you know it, we're gonna be done with it completely and then we can move on to some other fun things. Now before I go, I would just like to give a huge thank you to all of my supporters and wonderful people over on Patreon. You guys are awesome. And a huge special thank you to Gregory, Miguel, and Yupa for your support on Patreon. You guys are awesome. And yeah, so I hope you guys all have a wonderful day.